Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, it is amazing how it is amazing how many times adults feel like they have the world on their shoulders, but sometimes kids have concerns too, right? You have concerns about is my friends going to like me? You have concerns about if it's the first day of school, am I going to like school? Do you have concerns? What other concerns do you have? Allergies. Allergies, <laughs> yes. Is this, does these food have nuts in there? Am I going to have a reaction? Do I have to go to the hospital? Do I have to get medication? To go to the hospital. Yes, to go to the hospital. Um, to see someone who's sick, or maybe you're going to the hospital because you're sick. Anyone else? Anything else? Okay, sickness? Right? It prevents us from 
from letting go and opening to God. So in the Bible, on Matthew 11, 28, it states, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you know what that means? Well, it means that whenever you have worries, whenever you have concerns, don't hold it in. Don't let it weigh you down. Talk to God. Let Him know what your worries are. Let Him know what your concerns are. Ask Him for help. And then just let it go. And then when you let it go, you trust in God. By letting go, you trust in God. And you know that He's going to be there. He's going to help you along with your worries and your concerns. And you don't need to carry those burdens around anymore. You don't need to be weighed down by those concerns anymore. And you're lighter. You're able to achieve things. You're able to um, go to, go to, go to higher, higher capabilities and achieve more things by just letting go and just asking God for help. Okay? Yes. Did you have something to say? Okay, yes. Put the bag down and you'll go higher, higher, higher. All right. Amen. So, um, can anybody just summarize the message for today? Remember us that God is with you and Jesus will believe in ourselves. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Always um, bring your worries and concerns to God and He will help you um, shake them off. Yes. yes. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So anyone can help me say prayers today? Okay. All right. A lot of volunteers today. All right. Maybe we can say group prayer. All right. Ready? Close your eyes.
but he, he was convicted and he said, you know what, I want to do this for the family, I want to try this, and sure enough, he shut down his business on Saturday. To his wife's surprise, um, they actually made more money um, in six days than the seven days that were open previously. So at that moment, um, not only did he give his life to his to God um, through baptism, but his wife did too. And I want to share with you this appeal that God asks us to give him our lives and a portion of our income, knowing what he has done for us. Can we do any less for him than to obey? So with that last month, we give the first piece for it. I pray. For prayer. Father, thank you for promising to bless us as we obey you. Bless these, your tithes and your offerings, to further your work at home and around the world. Thank you for the story of Roberto and his family. I pray that you will inspire each one of us to also trust you in faith as we step out um, and do what you ask us to do in all aspects. All these things are great. Amen. Thank you. 
more. Um, I want to start with, I, thought, I think you were going to put something up for me, but it's not going to come up. So we'll just go ahead and start. So audacity. Audacity is the willingness to take bold risk. Oprah's all-time favorite guest is a woman by the name, oh, there she is, is a woman by the name of Dr. Terri Trent. She's a Zimbabwean woman who is described as a woman with unlikely educational success. And the reason for that is because she was born in a poor rural village in Zimbabwe, and because her family didn't have much, and because she was a girl, a female, she was not allowed to go to school. But she was very interested in education and reading, so what she did, what she did was, she took her brother's school books because he went to school, and she taught herself to read and write from his books. And she got to the point where she was so good that she started doing his homework for him. So when he would go to school, the teacher would see that not only is his homework being done, it's being done well, and it's being done better than anyone else in the class. So this teacher went and did some investigation. And she found, and this teacher, he or she, I'm not sure, found out that it's Tara Rai who's been doing her brother's homework. So she sat the parents down, or he sat the parents down and said, you need to send this child to school. She has the talent for it, she has the gift she needs to go to school. So eventually Tara Rai goes to school. But that was very short-lived, because when she was 11 years old, she was married off for the bright price of one cow at 11 years old. By the time she was 18, she had three children, and she was in an extremely abusive marriage. Hopeless situation. In 1991, the head of an international NGO visits her village, and during her visit, she gathers the women, she encourages the women to dream, and write down their, their dreams and what they want to achieve. So Terry Ryan, a piece of paper, writes down, that she wants to move to America, she wants to get a bachelor's degree, she wants to get a master's degree, and then she wants to get a PhD. She takes the piece of paper, she puts it in a little tin can, and buries it. That was in 1991. In 1998, she moves to America with her now five children and her husband. A few years later, she gets her bachelor's degree. In 2003, she gets her master's degree and her husband is deported for abuse, so she's not free of that abusive situation. And in 2009, she gets her PhD. The audacity of this girl to hope in hopelessness. The audacity of this girl to hope and dream that she was going to escape this violent, poverty, hopeless situation through the very thing that trapped her there, education. The audacity of her to hope and dream that she would one day move to America, get her bachelor's degree, get her master's degree with five children and an abusive husband, get her PhD, become a world-renowned speaker, author, educator, educator, and then find herself on Oprah's couch as her all-time favorite guest. But the reality is that terrorized situation was never really hopeless. Because hope is a desire. Hope is a feeling of expectation. And even when there was no reason to hope, all she had to do was believe. Amen. Because the PhD was hers the moment she picked up her brother's book. So all she had to do was believe. And that's the audacity of hope. I want to dive into this subject of hope with you a little more. So I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles with me to Romans 4, verse 18. And I'll just start reading so that we can get out of here early. I'll tell you a little secret. I came closer to you so that we can be more engaged. So the more engaged you are, the faster we'll leave here. <laughs> if anyone falls asleep, I'll just add that to the time I have to repeat what I'm saying while you're sleeping. So let's just stay engaged here, okay? All right. So Romans 4 verse 18, against all hope, in hope, oh, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact 
that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. So just like Terah, we see here an incredible display of hope. And though there was no reason to hope in respect to this promise, Abraham did not waver for unbelief. Other versions say, and when it seemed hopeless, Abraham hoped. One of my favorite translations says, when there was nothing left to hope for, Abraham hoped. So I had to wonder, why was Abraham so assured? If he knows that his body is dead and Sarah's womb is dead, how can Abraham be so sure, so confident that God will deliver on what he said he was going to do? And in order for us to understand this, we have to go back to the genesis of Abraham and God's relationship. So let's literally go back to Genesis, but also the beginning of their relationship, Genesis 12, verse 2. And a little bit of background, it's important to know that Abraham was not always a believer. He was not always um, a Christian or a follower of Christ. In fact, in his early years, Abraham was an idol worshiper. So God appeared to Abraham, spoke to Abraham, called on Abraham, and Abraham was um, converted, became a believer. And in, just, in Genesis 12, um, verse 2, well, I'll start at verse 1, but we'll read from verse 2. But God commands Abraham to leave Mesopotamia, which is where he lived, where he lived or lived at the time with his family, to go to this land that God promises to show him. So right at the beginning of their relationship, God is starting out with his promise. I want you to leave, pick up everything, go to this land, because I just want to show you something. God hasn't promised him anything yet except to show him something. And so far, Abraham is with it. And I don't know about you, I don't know how we with it. It takes a lot to get me to leave where I am just to come show me something. I don't know if you've ever grown up with your siblings and then the younger one comes and they're like, oh, come, come, I want to show you something. My next question is, what do you want to show me? Why don't you just bring it over here? Do I really have to go? Go tell me about it. But here Abraham, if God is saying, Abraham, let's go. I want to show you. And Abraham said, okay, I'm here for this. I can hear more. So then in verse 2, God adds to this promise of showing him a land. He adds a sevenfold promise to Abraham. He says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and, I will, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed to you. So on the sevenfold promise of blessings and nations and cursing people who curses him, Abraham departs Haran at the age of 75. So he's starting his walk with Christ at the age of 75. And throughout the next years and throughout the next chapters, Abraham goes through a series of trust-building exercises with God, hope-building exercises with God. So he, there, he gets the land, he gets to Canaan, the land that God wanted to show him. And God says, so I've showed you the land, but I also want to tell you that I'm promising this land to you and your people. So Abraham now has another promise, and he builds an altar there because God has promised, promised him this land. Then Abraham, there's a famine in Canaan, and Abraham goes to Egypt. And in, in Egypt, he lied about Sarai, his wife being his wife, his sister, his sister. So, his sister, she was a beautiful woman. The Pharaoh buries her in place for his house because God had promised Abraham that those who curse him will be cursed. So, even when, even when Abraham is responsible for the curse that's falling on these people, God is still cursing people on behalf of Abraham. So, God is coming through on these promises. When Abraham left Haran, he also left with his nephew Lot. And they got to the point where they had to separate. Because God had come through so much on the promise of blessing them that they were now having rich fights. We can't be too close to each other because I have too much things, you have too much things. You know, like I'm too rich, my millions are touching your millions, your billions are touching my billions. We need to separate. We can't be in the same area. So God is delivering. Abraham is being blessed. No one can touch Abraham. The people who are with Abraham are being blessed. Their, their properties multiplying, things 
are good. And things keep on happening. Um, and we know the stories. Lot is taken prisoner by a king, and Abraham is able to negotiate his release. Abraham is, be, is meeting kings and being blessed by kings, and things are going good. But then we get to Genesis 15. We get to Genesis 15, verse 1, and the tone changes. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham, and he's still Abraham here, in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. But, Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliza of Damascus. So, by now, Abraham, or Abram, is used to talking to God. He's used, he's used to hearing from God. So when God says, Abraham, do not be afraid, it's not because Abraham is scared because he's hearing a strange voice. It's because Abraham had really just been through it with his nephew Lot, who was, who was um, taken prisoner, and then he had to deal with the famine. So God is really just saying, relax, I'm just here to talk to you. But then God continues and says, I am your shield, your very great reward. What a blessing to have God himself come to you and say, I am your very great reward. But Abraham's not having it. Abraham says, first of all, Lord, you're my reward? Because I'm a little confused. We talked about nations. We talked about multitudes. You promised to make me a great nation. And I see you're giving me all these things, and I'm blessed, that's true. But what's the point of all this? if I don't have this son. Because what's the point of all this? The only person who's going to get everything you're giving me is my servant. So Abraham is catching an attitude because he's, he's confused. Where is this nation? I've been walking with you for years now. And in verse 3, he continues. He says, And Abraham said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my, my heir. So this is the part where parents usually do a double take. So not only did you have the nerve to catch an attitude with me once, you're going to do it twice. So Abraham again says, it's your fault I don't have children. And this just shows you how much Abraham's faith in God had begun to grow because Abraham decided that if he doesn't have children, it's because God did not want to give him children because he now knows that God can give him children. So he's blaming God, and he's making God responsible for the fact that he has no children, and that a servant will inherit everything that God is blessing him with. So Abraham is essentially saying, thank you for all the other great things you've done in my life, but I'm not even sure I want them if I can't have these kids. God responds. Verse 4. Then the, Lord, then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And Abraham believed the Lord. So God is direct and reassuring in his answer. And in many ways he's understanding. He's sort of saying, I get it, Abraham. I get it. And he says, you're going to have a son, and on top of that, you're going to have a biological son. This son is going to be blood of your blood, flesh of your flesh. Because I imagine that maybe Abraham saw this servant as more than a servant, maybe as like a son, to consider him as the inheritor of everything he had. But God is saying, you're not your inheritor. The person who's going to succeed you is not, is not going to be someone who is like a son. He is going to be a biological son. But what Abraham doesn't realize is that in this reaffirmation of his promise, God still required trust from Abraham. Because he did not tell him when he's going to have his son. He just said, you're going to have a son. And then he asked the visual, go outside, look at the sky. Look at the sky. Can you imagine back then in the desert sky, unpolluted desert sky, how beautiful it must have been at night. When all the stars and all the constellations and all the planets are up there shining bright because there's been no pollution yet. 
So Abraham went outside and he probably started counting. One, two, three, ten, twenty, a hundred. And then he gets lost and he starts over. Ten, twenty, forty, fifty, a hundred, five hundred. And he gets lost and he starts over. And then he starts to think in this promise. Wow, God. You're gonna make me, you're gonna make my nation this great? You're gonna make my nation this number? When I leave my tent and I go to the next tent, I still see more stars. And I go to the next tent and I still see more stars. This promise is great. I can't believe in this promise. So then he probably spoke to Sarah and said, Sarah, I spoke to God and this is what God said. We're going to have a son and he's going to be the father. I'm going to be the father of nations and you're going to be the mother of nations. And our nations are going to be as numbered as the stars. And then they probably, parental advisory advice for the next few comments, they probably started working on this promise right away. You know, we got to get started. Faith without works is dead. <laughs> So they started working on the promise, night after night, day after day, morning after morning. So the next month, Abraham is saying, Sarah, are you pregnant this month? No, not yet. Oh, it's okay. God is, God is a faithful God. He's going to come through on this promise. The next month, no, not yet, but it's still early. You know, God takes time to work. We need to give God time. Six months, nine months, one year, two years. And Abraham is having to look up at the sky every night, and he's realizing he's getting older, and Sarah's realizing he's getting older, and he's, and he's having to strengthen Sarah's faith and say, Sarah, look, you remember when God came to me in Haran, and he promised to show me the land, and he took me to the land, and he promised me the land, God's going to come through. Sarah, look. You remember when there was a famine in Canaan, and I was afraid, and I went to Egypt, and then the Pharaoh married you, but God married you and God delivered you back to me. But Sarah, look, remember when Lot and I had so much between the two of us, we couldn't be close to each other, we had to separate because God had blessed us so much. And then he said, Sarah, look, remember when they captured Lot and I had to go and deliver him, God was with me and it happened. And he's saying, Sarah, look, Sarah, look at the stars, look at what God has already done, God is going to come through. But Sarah's looking around, and Sarah's a woman, and Sarah, Sarah's realizing something's wrong, something's not adding up. This is not going to work for this man, and I don't know how to break it to Abraham that God's not going to give him a son to me. So Sarah decides, I'm barren, and she pulls a handmaid's tale. And I don't know if you've ever seen the show The Handmaid's Tale, but it's essentially the same concept. It's a woman who can't get pregnant, so she gives her husband her handmaid to have a child with him, and that child will become the promised child. So Sarah says to Abraham, look at my handmaid, Hagar, or Hagar. I never really figured out how to say her name in English. Hagar? Hagar. 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 Hagar, thank you. We'll just, we'll just go with it. You know what I'm talking about. And um, Sarah says, take her, marry her. In, in, in the hopes that she will give you a son. So just in the hope that she will give him a son, Abraham lays with Sarah, you know, they use the word lays in the Bible, very romantic, lays with Hagar, I mean, and she gets pregnant, and when Abraham is 86 years old, Hagar has a son, and his name is, is Ishmael. So at 86 years old, this son is born. He's not the promised child, but he's here, and we're just going to make do with what we can do. Sarah, as you know, wasn't very happy if you read the stories, but, but you know what? Abraham has his promised son, and I'm sure God is going to bless him. But God wasn't finished yet, because God hasn't delivered on his promise yet. So about 13 or 14 years later, Abraham is 99 years old, and God appears to him again. God appears to him, he's still Abram, and God changes his name to Abraham. And he says, I'm changing your name to Abraham because you're going to be the father of nations. And then he proceeds to change Sarah, Sarah's name, because Sarah used to be Sarai, changes Sarah's name to Sarah because you're going to be the mother of nations. And Abraham laughs. Abraham said, God, I'm 99 years old. You see Sarah over there. She really can't do much either at this point. I have my son Ishmael. I know it's not what you had planned for me, but he's here. He's biological. 
why don't you just bless him instead? Why don't you give him the promise instead? So Abraham is basically saying, I understand God, you know, like, you wanted to come through, but you couldn't. We helped you out, just bless Ishmael. And God says, no, Abraham, I not only promised you that you would be the father of nations, but I also promised Sarah that she would be the mother of nations. And I'm going to give you a son through your wife, Sarah. That's my promise to you. And in addition to this, God says, I won't forget Ishmael. I'm going to bless Ishmael, and he's also going to be the father of a nation. Because the blessing of Abraham wasn't just on Abraham, it was on everyone in his house. So if Abraham blessed you, then God would bless you too with the blessings and the promise of Abraham. So Sarah couldn't go through the story unblessed. Sarah couldn't go through the life and the story of Abraham without receiving her blessing because she was in the house of Abraham and she was due a promise too. She was to be the mother of nations too. So at 99 years old, God appears and makes this promise to Abraham. And when Abraham is about 100 years old, the Bible says, two men come to visit him and again reaffirm the promise. You're going to have a son through Sarah in about a year, and now, now God is giving him a time. In about a year, you're going to have a son through Sarah, and you're going to name him Isaac. And this time, unlike last time when Abraham laughed, Abraham believed unwaveringly that God is going to come through on this promise, even though at this point he is sure that his insides were dead. He says that my insides were as good as dead. And Sarah cannot bear children. She's past menopause. She is barren. She cannot bear children. And it comes to pass, just as God has said it, Sarah, a year later, gives birth through to a son named Isaac. What an incredible display of hope. But more specifically, what an incredible display of hope in God. Because I've come to realize that it matters who you hope in. You see, Sarah's hope was in herself. Sarah knew that she's a woman and she can get pregnant and she's going to give her husband a son. And when she realized that she could no longer give her husband this son, she considered everything she had, all her resources. There was no IVF by, back then. There was no surrogate parents back then. So back then, all she could do was take her hand in. So she took matters into her own, her own hands because she decided she's barren. Because she wasn't working with God, because when there's God, there is no can't, there's such a thing as being barren. So she decided to take it into her own, her own hands and give Abraham this promised son. But Abraham's hope was still in God. And that's why even 14 years after the birth of his first son, even 14 years after Sarah's probably walking around saying, I got you this son, when God reappears to Abraham, Abraham still believes. Because even though he has his first son, Abraham is still holding on to the hope that just like every other promise God had made to him, he would come through and giving him this son with this wife, Sarah. And what's the real difference, you see, between having just regular hope and having hope in God? Well, when you have just hope, you're expecting, but the risk you're taking, the audacity of just hoping, or the bold risk in just hoping is that you're hoping for something that may not be yours or that may never happen. So when you're just hoping for yourself, Lord, I hope I'll be a size six by June 1st. <laughs> yeah. See me on June 1st and I'll tell you where I am. I'm just hoping in myself and my own abilities and I have no idea how it's going to happen. And it might not be mine because you and I both know that realistically and June 1st is around the corner, and I'll still be this type. <laughs> um, but when you're hoping in God, you have to realize that you have now entered a relationship with God. And when you enter a relationship with God, there are two agendas. There's, and this is not just with God, this is in any relationship, a marriage, a friendship, a parent-child, employee-employer. There are two agendas, and the agendas now have to match. Your agenda, when we approach God, our agenda is to God to, is for God to make our lives good. God, I want to be married by 25. I want to be pregnant with my second child at 29, because I'm not having kids after 30. I want to be rich by 35, 
and I better be dead by 76 because I'm not going to a nursing home. So we give God this list, and we, see, we give God these timelines, and then we say, here, God, go. But God is a God. Jordan was saying this morning, we always think of God as the historical figure, this man, you know, that they paid for us, so then when we approach him, we approach him with such arrogance. God is a God. He's not a genie in our bottle. We don't get to rub God and say, God, I'm hoping for this, and I'll see you in five years with my two kids. That's not how God's work, or how God works. God's agenda in our lives is to develop our faith, to develop our characters, mm -hmm. to strengthen our faith. Mm -hmm. He's not interested in your temporal materialistic blessings. Mm -hmm. Now, don't get me wrong, he can use them to his purpose, he can use them to bless you. He can use them to develop you and grow your character. But God isn't here for your timeline. I, if I had a dollar for every single time, and I, actually, I don't even need a dollar. If I had just 50 cents or 25 cents for every time I, I, I heard one of my friends say, you know, last night I had to wrestle with God. Or I was driving home in the car and I was arguing with God. I woke up sweating because I was wrestling so hard with God. And I'm always thinking to myself, so the God, the Heavenly Father, the Sovereign Lord, comes to you in a vision, because He hasn't come to me yet, but He comes to you, and all you can think to do is wrestle, God, for the things that you asked Him for that He has not given to you yet. The arrogance of it all. You're driving home after a long day of work and you can't wait to get home and God comes and sits next to you and all you can think to do is argue with the Heavenly Father. And don't get me wrong, I'm not making fun. I used to be one of those people who would say, I spoke to God and God said it and I had to realize that I was really speaking to myself like, as God because I wanted something and I wanted to do something so I would convince myself that God told me to do it. So I don't, if you do speak to God, that is all you. But when He comes to you in that state, you want to argue with him over the things he hasn't given to you? I was speaking to a friend of mine about this passage, and he said, it's interesting that Abraham at 86, or at 99, or at 70 something, um, was getting frustrated with God, because Abraham lived to be 175 years old. So if you're gonna be 175 years old, and you don't have kids at 86, I think it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but then he said, it's just, but we do the same thing today, Elizabeth. I'm 45 and I don't have a kid. I'm 50 and I haven't finished this degree. I'm 55 and I haven't started this business. I'm 35 and I'm still not married. But what's it to you if you're 35, 40, and you haven't achieved something, if you're going to live to be 80, 90? When God is promising you something as long as there is still breath in you, he's going to give you enough time to not only realize your promise, but enough time to live it and enjoy it. Yeah. I look now when I see these, and I see women, you know, the women in Hollywood, they're giving birth at like 55, 56, and I have to think, well, maybe I'll be you, Liz. You know, sorry, Mom, we miss out on the grandchildren. But maybe at 56 is when I'll be a mother, but then I'll be fine because then God must have provisions for me to be here and enjoy my children past Maybe you'll achieve, I hear great stories of, of people who graduate college at 89, 99 years old. It took them 99 years, but guess what? They're still here, they did it, they made it, and God realized it for them. That's the bold risk you take when you place your hope in God. You're taking the risk of saying, God is God, God is good, and I'm convinced that He only wants good things for me, and that he will give them to me in my time. Because what's promised to you is yours. Whether it was promised to you before you were born, before you were formed in your mother's womb, whether God came and spoke it to you in a dream, whether God wrote it down to you or someone spoke it over your life, what's yours is yours and will be yours. Amen. But the most important thing of putting your faith in God or of putting your hope in God is realizing and being prepared for God to get to the bottom of your unbelief. He's going to want to know if you're just using Him to get what you want or if you really truly believe 
that he will do it for you. And that's why Abraham had to be stripped, Abraham and Sarah had to be stripped of all their human resources before God could bless them with a son. It would have been great if at 86 when Sarah came up to Abraham and said, Abraham, here's Hagar, go and lay with Hagar, that Abraham said, no, I'm going to wait on God. But they were still relying on their human resources, so God couldn't be sure yet. God couldn't be sure yet that Abraham really believes that I'm going to come through on this. And God had to get to the bottom of his, of his unbelief. And that's just what God did. The audacity of hope in God. I wish Abraham was alive today and could see his promise fulfilled. And I mean really fulfilled. Like he got to see Isaac and he lived for another 75 years after that. But I, I wish he could see just how numbered his nation had become. I wish he could try and count the stars that we have left and maybe even realize that there are more people in his nation than there may be stars left in this in this blue sky. I wish Abraham could see this. But more importantly, knowing that I am part of the promise and the descendants, that we are part of this nation of Abraham, I wish that we knew then what we know now. I wish that I knew then that God had all these amazing things planned for me now because I would have complained a little less, I would have wrestled a lot less, I would have cried a lot less, I would have been frustrated a lot less had I known that the promise was going to happen the way it's happening now. I wish I had stopped fighting and hoping for things that I wanted and being upset when God didn't give them to me because the things He has given to me are so great, are so beautiful, are so amazing. One of my favorite songs is a song that says, I will trust in you. And the song essentially says, you did not create me to worry. You did not create me to fear. You created me to worship, so that's what I'm going to do. My hands are raised because I surrender, and I believe that your word is true. You promised to never leave me, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to put my trust in you. So I'm going to trust God. I'm going to have the audacity to put my hope in God. I'm going to have the audacity, I'm going to take the bold risk of putting my dreams, my hopes, my desires, and everything in God, trusting that God wants only what's best for me. And I'm going to hope that you're going to do the same. And that's the end of my long talk for today. I think, or I feel like I want to just say a quick prayer. Is that all right? And then we'll pass it up to wherever I'm assuming I'm closing. He's actually sleeping, so thank so much for that chance. We can't go sing. Um, Father God, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your provisions. I want to thank you for the promises that you made to Abraham, the promises that you made to my parents and my parents' parents, and the promises that you made to me. But God, I want to thank you for the promises that you made to the parents of the people in this room, to the people in this room themselves, to the promise that you made to their children, that you want what's best for them, that you know what's good for them. God, I'm asking that you renew their faith and you renew their strength and you renew their covenant, their covenant covenant with, with them so that they know that whatever it is that you promised them that they haven't received yet, it's coming. They just need to believe. Lord, I'm asking you to help them remember that in your timeline there is no such thing as too late. There is no such thing as barren. There is no such thing as too old. There is no such thing as dead bodies because you have the ability to bring life out of dead wounds. Lord, I'm asking you that we may continue to be a blessing, not just to ourselves, not just to our families, but to the people who touch us. Let our lives be a testimony of just how faithful you are, of just how you always come through in your promises, God. And Lord, I'm asking you to help us to hope in you. I'm asking you to help us remove ourselves and teach us to hope in you and teach us to let go of these desires and just trust in what you have planned for us. God, you've come through before. We've seen it so many times in our lives. You've done it before. We've seen it so many times in our lives. So now we're just going to surrender 
and we're just going to allow you to do it for the rest of our lives, whatever, how long that's going to be. And we're just going to sit back and watch you do your thing, Father. We're just going to sit back and watch the show go on. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah.